Hi, I'm Joel Weber, the editor of Bloomberg Businessweek. Welcome to our town hall on working for yourself during the coronavirus. The pandemic is making it tougher for the millions of Americans who are self-employed, be they freelancers, gig workers, or sole proprietors. Together, they make up more than one out of every three working Americans. Even the best of times, they operate largely without benefits. No sick leave, no unemployment, no paid time off. Many of them say their work has dried up and that getting access to emergency relief funds is proving harder than for other workers. Our Bloomberg Business Week Town Hall brings together a few insightful panelists to talk about their search for answers, how to find emergency relief, and what their businesses might look like in the future. Joining me is my colleague, Demetra Casanetas, a senior editor with Bloomberg News, who's led the magazine's coverage of small business for the past few years. Demetra, thanks for joining me. She'll be with us in a second. There she is. There Hello. I am. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for this. Today's town hall is part of our Bloomberg Business Week Small Business Survival Guide, which Demetra is overseeing. You can find more content and resources at businessweek.com, as well as on our social accounts. And please listen to her weekly small business segment on Bloomberg Radio every Tuesday. We have some great guests who will also be joining us, and we're looking forward to talking with them about this important topic. They are Ed Wu who's a freelance cinematographer behind Wuhawk Productions. Also Cynthia Boyce, who's an attorney, entrepreneur, and mediator. Katie Valestria, vice president at the National Association for the Self-Employed. And Rafael Espinal, the president of the Freelancers Union. This is the third in our series of small business town halls. Please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties. We plan to speak with each of our guests for about five minutes during this town hall. And once we have all of them in the room together at the end, we'll turn it into a 30 minute Q and A, which happens to be one of the best features about this format. It's basically interactive. If you have a question you'd like to ask any of our guests, please type it into the comments and we'll do our very best to field as many as we can when we get to that point in the program. You can also use the hashtag BWTownHall. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our first guest, Ed Wu. Ed, that is a sensational mohawk. Happy Thank day. you very much. <laughs> um, so, Ed, your your industry as a cinematographer feels like it's basically on hold. Uh, how's that going? Uh, you know, it's been a couple weeks now, months now. You probably have some answers, but in general, what what do you know? Yeah, completely. Um, at first, it was very shocking to happen. Uh, I had a couple gigs that were lined up. And they all just canceled and shut down. Um, Hollywood is basically shut down. It recently started to come back a bit. There's a show in Iceland that uh, just happened. And there's one that in Australia that just happened as well. Uh, they were following precautions now with um, uh, how to make the set safe, basically. Uh, and our industry is going to change definitely in the near future and possibly in the long term and how we approach safety on set and how we, uh, how we interact with each other on set because it's such close quarters with each other, uh, while we're shooting a film, uh, the spread is just very easy. So. But in terms of how I have been doing, um, it's been very rough. Thankfully, I have had savings. And as a freelancer, I plan for this, uh, for an emergency to come. That, and I've also been collecting unemployment. And I've been one of the fortunate few that have been able to collect uh, unemployment because I, throughout the year, I work for W-2s as well as 1099s. So I'm like a 50-50 split between W-2s and 1099s. Um, so I've been able to collect unemployment and take uh, benefits from the CARES Act, uh, as well as the extra stimulus check, obviously. Tell me, um, Ed, a little bit about 
uh, you had mentioned that, you know, you've got some savings and I think a lot of freelancers such as yourself who, whose work is freelance all the time plan for it. But what, what are some of the challenges and what kind of, you know, what's a resource that you have available to you to work through things like whether it's a health insurance issue or, um, or anything related to that? I mean, I'm assuming you're a member of a union. And so um, maybe that's, that's some source of support to folks like yourself um, in Hollywood specifically. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, first off, I think the biggest uh, issue at hand is that the stress of not knowing when you're going to come back to work. That is that is the biggest thing that I'm dealing with. And I think most freelancers are dealing with. Like, I think if there are any resources, like my union uh, does have resources for mental health. I think that is very important. Uh, like, just trying to keep a sane head during these times because everyone else is going through it. And so I think that is a big thing. Um, and my union, uh, like you said, I'm part of the local 600, the IATSE uh, Cinematographers Guild. And they have uh, been talking to uh, the professionals in our industry on how to make our sets coming up that once we get back safe. And in the current times, they, I think our, a lot of our biggest issues are with healthcare and what's gonna happen with healthcare. Because typically as a freelancer, if you're not part of a union, um, you're not collecting health insurance. You're going to be paying and providing your own. Uh, thankfully, being part of the union, uh, based on some criteria, uh, you are able to collect uh, uh, health insurance uh, and benefit off of that. Um, so uh, the biggest issue there is for us in the cinematographers union is we need to have a certain number of hours. Uh, and so lost right now, lost none of us are working. So we're all worried about- Yeah, we lost you there for a second. If you could repeat yourself. Oh, um, Just as you yeah, were transitioning so, uh, from saying that there were friends. concerns about healthcare, um, you were saying for now, what we're all, and then it sort of got mumbled. Yeah, what we're all worried about is uh, we have to qualify for 400 hours per half year yeah. uh, to qualify for health insurance. Yeah. And so but we're all not working right now. So yeah. <laughs> there's, it's impossible to gain hours right now. And so my benefits end in, uh, in September. And I'm worried about, well, if I'm not going to work up until September, how am I going to gain my hours in order to qualify for health insurance? Mm -hmm. And if I don't qualify, then I'm going to have to pay out of pocket, uh, which are additional expenses on my year, basically. So right. I think that's the biggest concern of most of my union members, uh, besides the safety concerns of what happens when we get back. Right. And and when you when you talk to um, others, um, sort of in your, you know your peer set, I mean, is everybody is it a cold hard stop for everyone, or or are there are you seeing rays of hope? elsewhere in the industry that you can start to sort of strive for? I always try, I always want to try to stay positive. I think there are rays of hope. And my agent actually contacted me the other day uh, about some potential jobs. Uh, if you own gear uh, yourself, uh, they're, they're doing some smaller uh, commercials out there that uh, are able to shoot with like a one man, one person crew uh, to go out and shoot uh, some B-roll or shoot some people mm -hmm. in their houses, like less people, basically a very small amount of people on set. So that glimmer of hope is very nice. And then also hearing that Iceland and Australia are starting back up uh, with some uh, with some safety precautions in place uh, are definitely glimmers of hope. Uh, I mean, things are definitely going to be different when we get back, and that's just the reality of it. And I'm not sure how that's going to be. Uh, and also, I don't know if we want to come back too early because the safety concerns are so uh, prevalent right now. So right. that's interesting. I was just going to say very quickly, there was an article yesterday in the L.A. Times about how Hollywood and a lot of productions are looking abroad to whether they can shift what they're doing. But the timing is an issue because we don't know how this thing is traveling and where it might spike next. So it does need a lot more caution. Yeah, Joel. Okay, um, thank you, Ed. We're gonna go ahead and bring in our next guest, guest Cynthia Boyce. Hi, Cynthia. Hello. 
Good so, afternoon. <laughs> thank you for joining us. I, I'm so interested to talk to you because uh, the little bit that I've been able to, you know, learn about you so far, you you've really got this multiple revenue stream thing going on. You're an attorney, you're an entrepreneur, a mediator. You had an Airbnb. So I'm really curious, you know, you've got multiple streams of revenue, but they've all taken a hit now. And how are you, how are you navigating that time when suddenly all the, all the ways that you would usually make money have sort of had to change? Well, they've all changed, but they're not all dried up. And uh, so there are a couple of things that I've done. So, yeah. One of the things I learned uh, some time ago was that it's, it's really, it's really beneficial to have more than one stream of income if you're gonna work for yourself, because yourself can't always, you know, do what you needed to you, yourself to do. So, you know, you have to be able to look at different places and and uh, find, use different skill sets. So, um, yeah, I had in place, I, I count like basically four um, pots. Uh, one is uh, doing private attorney work. And of course that dried, a lot of that's dried up because people don't have the money. Um, I do talk with clients on the telephone. Um, now I can use virtual because I've learned how to do that. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, I, I intentionally work with people who are middle income. And so a lot of them are in the same boat. They don't want to spend too much money. I have a guardianship practice, uh, which I get a lot of my work from the courts. Courts have dried up. And so I do have work, but there... Um, I always know that the the uh, cash flow is going to be uh, take a long time, but now it doesn't even start till the courts open. So I've been working, but I probably won't see income from that work for about a year. Um, and then I have uh, the mediation practice, which is our is a really bright spot uh, because that is usually that's where you're you're trying to help people navigate um, disputes. And that is continuing because a lot of us has, have learned how to mediate online. So some people were doing it before, but now it's big. So, I mean, I don't have a lot of work yet, but that is starting to gear up. So I have to ask a cheeky question. Are there, is there a surge in disputes right now? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I'm expecting it. A number of, you know, in, in networking, a number of people are expecting it. And that actually, I've, I've um, opened myself up and said, uh, I will do uh, disputes for um, for free, you know, mediations uh, if it's COVID related or at a, a very reduced price. Because I'm expecting a lot of disputes, and, and I like to help people try to resolve those. So, and the Airbnb that that's travel industry, so you know that dried up. So, it's interesting. I mean, certainly one common thread among all of our discussions over the weeks is, you know, to what extent technology is really stepping in to help people mm -hmm. recoup something, uh, whether it's social media that's enabling food businesses to suddenly connect with their customers, whether it's something like what you're describing, using technology and the internet to get people connected on Zoom or whatever you're using. So there's a pivot, whether you're running a business with 10 or five employees or whether you're a solo, um, you know, sort of pr proprietor like you are and working for yourself. And um, I mean, was that, um, I'm just curious, like if that's been uh, tricky for you, like to just be, be able to say, okay, I really have to figure out some new tools and, and figure out how to put them in place. Um, how was that process for you? Well, you know, I, I, I'm constantly learning. I mean, a lifelong learner, that's how you, and, and yeah, as a, um, as an entrepreneur, you it's innovation that you bring to your practice. You're trying to always figure out what the needs are and how you're going to get there. So um, I was actually really excited. A number of mediators got together and we started exploring um, how we could do virtual mediation because there's some you know special tools we need, and uh, and then we we practiced with one another, and and then you know as we each did one. We came back and reported how it went. So it's been great to learn. And um, I actually, yeah, I've actually even worked with a, a client who's, a, I work with vulnerable um, adults. So I've been able to work with uh, an, um, a vulnerable adult on the phone, I mean, uh, with um, virtual, a virtual meeting. So that's been really challenging, but you know, you just try to figure out how to make it work. Mm -hmm. And since Maybe it's a good moment to kind of broaden that out and talk. You know, you really have embraced that spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, 
kind of a hustler. What advice yeah. do you have for other people who are maybe in, you know, not not in the same place as you, but are are similarly trying to make the most of this moment? What advice do you have for them? Yeah, a couple of things that um, that I've done. And yeah, I used to call myself a professional hustler. You know, <laughs> I show my, my parents like that with a law degree, like, <laughs> but, you know, you're constantly trying to figure things out. So um, when this, you know, first before it fully hit, I got on the on the the uh, email and contacted a couple. I looked at my accounts receivables. I said, "Okay, got a couple of folks that should be uh, it should be right for them to be paying me." So I was really fortunate. You know, those who believe in God, this was like thank you God moment. Um, a couple of them came through with the payment. So you know, early in the the uh, shelter in, um, I then contacted. I I own a house. Uh, so I contacted my lenders. Now, here's where government's really important. New York uh, governor, I'm in, in New York, Cuomo had already put in place that you have to give everyone three months um, moratorium on the uh, mortgage. So that was helpful. I you know, went online, was able to do that easily. And, uh, and then insurance took a little, it was a little different because that was not, um, uh, at the time, was not an executive order. Um, and then I, I did something, I um, after I sort of could breathe, um, I said, okay, let me see if there's some government money that applies. And I went for the PPP loan and screwed up twice. Didn't, you know, got denied. And so no, no, loan. Huh? no loan. I mean, I got- Very good company. Yeah, so denied and no reason. Um, and then, you know, I've been networking. So what, my church and my- um, my congressman Jeffries uh, came together with a town hall and they explained how PPP worked for sole proprietors. So, you know, I, I was looking at these global things where they're saying, you know, this it's there for you. And I'm saying, but I, you know, I don't know. It was, so if, if you want it, whenever you want me to, I can share a couple of tips for people who are sole proprietors, no employees, um, how you can get your PPP loan. Well, we're gonna we're gonna leave a cliffhanger there because we're definitely okay. gonna come back to it because okay. it, it's I, I really want to know the answers to that. Um, but we're gonna bring uh, Katie on as our next guest. Okay. Hi, Katie. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. So you're you're the vice president at the National Association for the Self Employed. Uh, I'm guessing you've been pretty busy of late, and I'm wondering how you're talking <laughs> to your constituents and and what you're telling them about going forward. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, I think at the top of the call, you mentioned it's been kind of an interesting, uh, you know, approaching three months of... Uh, I lost track. Uh, yeah, no, I know. I actually, I like stopped. You saw me pause. I was like, wait, what is it? It's interesting. I was um, actually in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, right before the shutdown. So I always can backtrack to that trip to know when uh, things started getting out of hands. But yeah, it's it's been it's been a whirlwind. I think we've all lost track of time, and I think especially when you're talking about the self-employed um, and small business community, it has been a, a it has been a fast-moving train um, that has that has uh, that's taken up a lot of time, <laughs> in a good way. Now, tell us something about the world of people that are part of your organization, self-employed. What's the biggest misconception? That any that, that we all have about what it means to be self-employed and a, a misconception that might in some way shed some light on the challenges that they're confronting right now. Yeah, you know that's actually that is a that is a strong question, and I think the biggest uh, misconception is that uh, the and I think it's let me go back. I, there's 27 million self-employed individuals, and that does not in our calculation include the gig workers or those who are. Uh, as we would call it, have a side hustle going on. And so I think the biggest misconception is actually their size and their economic impact. Um, and I and I do think what has been interesting through CARES, uh, you know, and CARES 2.0, and then what could be the next bill is the recognition and the realization of how critical the self-employed, and I would even use micro business, that's who we also represent. So 10 or less employees okay. population has um, on our economy and actually on our communities. And, and so it's, in one way, this crisis has 
I think affirmed for our association and our members, you know, their value in ensuring that they are um, solvent and are able to weather this, you know, global pandemic because they are so crucial to our economy. Um, and I think the other thing that people don't realize is small businesses is what pulls us out of recession. So uh, small businesses actually grow, the self-employed actually grow uh, during economic downturns. And yes, you know, a percentage of people is because they've been laid off and they're looking for new professional opportunities. Um, but it's the, it's the small businesses that are going to start to hire sooner, that are going to um, be able to bring people back to work. And then the self-employed, you know, when you're, when you're kind of I don't want to say left holding the bag, but in some ways this actually pushes people in a positive way to explore self-employment. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, just remind our audience, if, you've got, if you have any questions, please hit us up with comments using the uh, hashtag BW Town Hall so that we can ask some questions of people like Katie once we get to the group uh, chat in a few minutes. Um, uh, so Katie, I'm, I'm really curious, like you mentioned CARES Act 1, CARES Act 2, there's potential for hopefully more. Yeah. What are you hearing from people? What do they need? You know, what, what is this community desperate for still? Yeah, and in fact, while you were talking with our other guests, I was, uh, on, I was on my iPhone uh, furiously because the House just announced that they will vote next Wednesday on a paycheck protection bill that clarifies and I think streamlines a lot of the challenges that people have been having with the program. And so that is good news. Uh, here's what I think is I think people need money. Uh, I, I think especially for the small business community and I, and I would, I, you know, I really want to talk about the small business community that is like 50 or less employees. I think that's the true nature and some of your um, audience might know the SBA defines a small business with 499 less or less employees. That's a huge swath yeah. of this community. So I like to really hone in on that 50 or less employee, um, but they need money. Um, and it's, it's really complicated. And I know that there are some, um, you know, people who can speak to it better, but you know, the margins in which a lot of these small businesses run on are incredibly small and they have um, financial obligations. They have leases for their property. They have ongoing costs. Uh, and, you know, they are trying to do the best to position themselves to come back when we can safely um, and based on science um, to operate those businesses. And so they need money. And I think they need, uh, unfortunately, I think they need no strings attached uh, as it relates to if they can show you know, that they were able to successfully bring back their business, that's great. But the problem is we're going to have so many businesses that are going to fail. And, and that is what is scary. And that is what we need to be working towards is how do we um, insulate to the best of our ability through numerous tools that we have in support of those small businesses coming back, hiring people, paying their state and local taxes. Like it's a, I keep on saying it's a three-legged stool. And if we're sawing at the stool, we have to saw it at a little bit evenly because we can't just flip the stool right. because it's not going to benefit the community as a whole. There are huge issues. And that span that you described is really interesting because forget about the difference between 499 and 50 and under. There's also a world of difference between a 50 employee business and a, and a person who is just on their own, yeah. which in many cases that individual might be very unaware of anything that's available to them. Yeah. So then there's a whole other layer, right? Of yeah. outreach and trying to reach those people and let them know how they can get help and what they're going to get help with. I mean, yeah. what, um, what, have you seen in, in that sort of way in terms of like people who actually have employees who have some sense of there are benefits to be had and others who maybe just think I'm on my own, I'm on my own. Like that's what that means. Well, up until, you know, insert whatever date it was that CARES was packed. I mean, the, the past, the self-employed was on their own. You know, they weren't eligible for unemployment you know, previous, they've never been eligible for the 7A lending program. Uh, you know, they've, they've never been actually recognized by mm -hmm. both the state and federal government for who they are. And guess what? I, to answer, to like put a, to put in a, a exclamation point on your question, the self-employed, they are businesses of one. Like they cannot be undersold. They are, they are so crucial to our economy. So yes, they have been long forgotten. They have actually, I think a little bit been, you know, a little bit of a stepchild of the business community. And so to have it so quickly reverse that they all of a sudden are eligible for these benefits. And then, you know, I, 
am trying to show a lot of grace these days. And I know that many states, you know, were not prepared and, you know, had issues with their unemployment systems. But, you know, you can hear for so from so many self-employed people that, you know, their businesses failed. They they lost all their business. They go to file for unemployment. They're denied. You know, the state of New York, which I, you know, know that you call home, you know, there was something like they were getting 40,000 calls a day to the state unemployment line. Um, if I'm remembering, they, there was a really good segment on 60 Minutes a few weeks back. And the volume and, you know, people are freaking out. And I, and I mean that in a really genuine way. They need to pay their rent. They have childcare expenses or, ch or expenses related to their children. You know, one thing we can talk about later is health insurance. Like it is causing an immense amount of stress, but we are at least hopeful that this recognition of the importance of the self-employed community uh, will continue past this pandemic, you know, and provide ways in which the self-employed can pay into unemployment, that they yeah, will have concern. access to the benefit yeah. and that, you know, we'll have a mechanism in which the self-employed can access a lot more federal benefits. Mm -hmm. well, you mentioned healthcare, and I'm going to use that opportunity. We're going to bring in our last guest, Raphael, to talk a little bit more about uh, being, being in the freelancers union. Um, Raphael, you, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. What, what um, boggles my mind a little bit, as I understand it, I think you took over this role as president of the Freelancers Union in what, January? No, March, actually. March. <laughs> oh, oh my like, gosh. Yeah. Pretty good moment to take on a, a, on a huge new role. Um, so you're, it's been a baptism by fire, no doubt. Um, and, and talk to us about what you guys are doing at the Freelancers Union to, to help people who, you know, are very vulnerable right now and, and you know, are holding onto their insur insurance by a thread. Yeah, well, you know, to be honest, we have been in crisis mode since this pandemic has hit. Uh, I'm used to it. I was an elected official for over eight years in New York City. Uh, but, uh, we, you know, we've been very concerned about what the, what the impact has been on, on our membership. We represent over 500,000 people, uh, mostly in New York and California. Uh, but when we ran surveys, we found that 90% of them uh, have reported to have lost income or expect to be completely uh, out of work by the time this pandemic is over. So we've been focusing a lot on advocacy. Uh, I was, as was mentioned earlier, the CARES Act uh, really played a huge role in ensuring that freelance workers had access to the benefits that traditional workers have, like unemployment insurance. So it was one of the first steps we took in fighting and making sure that was expanded, uh, which it was. Uh, it, it, it's a blessing in that Finally, people can apply for it, but the downfall has been is that they haven't been able to get through. And those who have qualified, for example, in New York and California are having issues with how they're reporting their income with W-2s and 1099s, and then receiving a less payout or a weekly payout than what they should have been getting because of that confusion of those two forms of payment. Uh, but we uh, have been just doing everything we can to get that information that's been coming out of Washington, getting it to the hands of our members and, and the freelancers at large, uh, and looking at also how can we as a union provide direct benefit and which we which is why we launched a freelance or freelancers relief fund we started uh, uh, collecting donations from those who can donate uh, and getting 100% of those dollars back into the hands of freelancers through direct payments of 500 to 1000 uh, dollars now we're looking at how can we get groceries to workers because we're now hitting the 3 month mark uh, people can't pay their rent a lot of them haven't qualified for unemployment yet uh, and they're really concerned about how they're going to, you know, put food on the table. So, yeah, we're doing everything we can on our end. Is the qualifying for unemployment question um, and not hearing back on that a matter of, as we see with other forms of relief now, over the system being overwhelmed and processing it all? Or are there questions because it came together very quickly and it's unclear um, exactly what the details are of me versus you, given what I do and how many hours I do it and so on and so forth. I mean, where is that um, confusion and question over qualifying for it coming from? I think it's really all, all of those things. You know, I, I think we saw the, the federal and state government trying to fly a plane while building it. And uh, and the state would, you know, would argue that the federal government uh, did not give them enough guidance and enough time for them to be able to build out the right systems to uh, take on these new applications. Uh, but what we're hearing now from freelance workers is that uh, those that have been able to get through and those that have been able to prove how much income they made in a year, uh, states like New York and California specifically have decided to only take account the W-2s and not the 1099s, which show the majority of the income they're making, and then determining that they're going that, that they're going to get a less payout uh, because of that. So we're 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 actually advocating right now 
uh, to make sure that the federal government clears up that language and ensures that all income is being considered uh, so that freelancers so that they can get bigger payments. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Rafael, um, Ed at the top um, was talking about how how concerned he is about not being able to get a certain number of hours that would you know allow him to have the insurance that you know it, it will you know protect him going forward. I'm curious, you know, from your perspective and and working at the freelancers union, how are you guys starting to negotiate with insurers to make sure that people, regardless of their situation, if they're in your union, are going to be able to have insurance since we don't know what the end necessarily looks like. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the union uh, operates in a way in which you know, we, we're a place where if you don't have health insurance, you can come to us, we'll connect you to providers who are friendly to freelancers, who might uh, uh, provide a more affordable rate. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing actively, speaking to the insurers and seeing what sort of, what sort of uh, programs they're putting in place to ensure that the independent worker can get certain discounts and maybe maybe even get a get a better premium moving forward. Uh, so you know I, I think that that what Ed is is encountering um, a lot of folks are, are seeing and, and they're really turning to us to 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 figure out how can we provide them the the most affordable health health insurance. But um, you know I, I think it's it's important that that those who aren't insured also know that open enrollment has been extended in state in, in states so that if you don't have health insurance you should come to the union and, and or your own union. And apply for the health insurance now if you need it. That's good. That's an important point to emphasize. Yes, and that's information. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask very quickly in terms of all of this. I know there's a lot of information on your website um, that helps people try to sort through some of this. Do you guys also provide any kind of direct like service to freelancers who contact you, members, about guiding someone through the process of applying for this, or is it information that you're giving them and they're going to have to take that on themselves? Um, yeah, so we, we try to do it all, uh, and it depends, right? If you're applying for health insurance, well, we do have a broker in-house uh, who will help you apply for, for health insurance, disability, uh, life, for example. We've seen a big uptick on life insurance. Unfortunately, a lot of folks are concerned about their own health going through this crisis. Um, and also, we, we uh, provide programming, free legal programming, uh, to freelancers who are having issues collecting payment uh, from clients. Uh, we've heard from a lot of our members uh, for, that have not been paid for work that they completed in January and February. Uh, they're getting, uh, you know, excuses that they can't be paid because of the pandemic. But it turns out that when we are able to apply pressure as a union and help them through the process, at the end of the day, they do end up getting paid. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we try to give that, that white glove experience on along all of those lines. Mm -hmm. You know, just thinking back to my, my first question where, you know, you, you're new to this role as of March. There might be a lot of people who are also just going to be new to being a freelancer soon based on the way this economy is going and, and the job numbers. What advice do you have for them who, you know, people who are going to be perhaps new to, you know, being a freelancer and, and you know, that's being a completely new experience for them? Yeah. You know, I, I've been hearing a, a lot about concerns whether people are going to want to freelance, given, you know, how how the, the economy has left them. To hang and dry uh, without with every little benefits, but I really do believe that you know the recessions have shown in the past that you know employers and companies uh, start depending on on, in the, on independent workforce as they themselves have to downsize uh, and cannot afford a traditional worker. They end up on these independent contractors to be able to come in to help build them back up. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity across the board. And the advice I, I give to freelancers is now's the time to start upskilling. Now's the time to start networking. Uh, you know. Now is the time to think about who are, who would be potential reliable clients that you can hold on in the long term. And if you're someone new, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, glamour behind the idea of freelancing. You know, you think, oh, I can make my own hours. I can work whoever I want to. But again, a lot of the anxieties come with whether or not you're going to have unemployment insurance if you just end up losing work. So uh, I would say be prepared for all of those things and uh, just look at how you can hone your skills, build in your skills. And look and potentially look for reliable clients moving forward. Well, um, the one thing I was gonna ask about uh, when we were speaking to Katie, and she was saying she was referring to the total number that are categorized as you know freelance uh, working on their own sole proprietors, twenty seven million, I think, not including gig workers, right? So what um, what is the issue around that? I mean. Um, why is there that distinction and what is it that they should know themselves about 
uh, you know, how they do or don't factor into a lot of this stuff that we're talking about with the benefits, with the relief and so on, because, you know, they're hearing statistics that reference freelancers and sole proprietors, but it doesn't include gig, gig workers. I'm a gig worker. I might hear that and think, oh, well, I guess nothing's, you know, available to me. Um, so what, what do you say to that sort of pool of people out there, the, the specifically the gig workers, the drivers and so on? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a movement happening nationally to make sure that those workers are not misclassified and that if they are being misclassified, that the companies they work for end up providing them with the benefits that a traditional employee would get. As we saw in California, way B5, uh, there, that, that bill is being replicated in states across the country. Um, and uh, I would say, I would also talk to the distinction, right? I mean, freelancers would say, hey, we're professional freelancers, we're writers, you know, we went to college to get our degree, gig workers, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't identify with gig workers because we, this is what we do professionally full time. Um, but I, at the same time, I would say that they're all a valued workforce and we have to work across the board to making sure that all those workers are receiving the benefits, uh, you know, uh, across the board. You know, we we look at uh, we we think a lot about what portable benefits could look like, so that you know anyone who, whether you're gig, consider yourself a gig worker or a freelance worker, could could have access to health insurance, could have access to unemployment insurance, have access to uh, disability uh, without being concerned about being tied to a certain employer. I think that'll be a, an important theme that we'll actually maybe spend a little bit more time on here in a few minutes because we'll we'll go ahead and take this moment to open it up and turn it into a group conversation. So we'll welcome back Ed and Cynthia and Katie. And look at that, it's the Brady Bunch. Only, only with better people. Um, so, uh, Demetra, do you wanna start us off? Well, I mean, I, uh, you know, we were just talking about a lot of these things. So I had a question for Ed, which was, you know, um, can you can you offer some advice and speak to how you've managed your career? I mean, again, you're technically on your own, you're freelance, but do you approach it as like, this is my business. So I've got to set it up and run it as I would, whether I'm working for someone else or working for myself. And to what degree do you think that has helped you and even provided a layer of, let's say, protection right now? Because as you said, you know, this is how you work. So, you know, to put some extra away to rely on that. But, um, you know, advice in terms of managing the career and managing the work in a way that going forward um, will better sort of, you know, we'll, we'll have a little bit of a buffer for you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely approach it with a business mindset. Um, I think early on when I was freelancing, I made a conscious decision to touch up my business aspects of what do I need to do to survive if something bad happens. Uh, and so I researched a lot, read books, looked up blogs to find out what are the things I can do in order to survive basically. And ultimately it's saving money, keeping my expenses down and having at least three months of income that I can sit on as a buffer if something happens uh and that in this exact scenario has you know kept me sane really because i am able to feel comfortable that i am getting these unemployment benefits but currently you know i don't have to worry so much because i have that safety net under me so i would say the best thing to do is to research find out as much as you can about uh, supporting yourself monetarily in order so that when things happen, you're not out of luck. Cynthia, I want to, we left you on a, on a cliffhanger that I think a lot of people will resonate with, but that idea of PPP for sole proprietors, can you tell us what you discovered? Uh, got to unmute. There we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so it was great listening to all of the uh, panelists. That's some great ideas. Um, you know, that I just, but one was that it's got to be active income, not uh, passive. So rental, um, Airbnb does not, it's not included under the PPP. But if you have a Schedule C, then, or you use Schedule C, that's the, for self employed, we use uh, Schedule C on the 1040, our, our tax, our federal tax return. You need to fill out the schedule C for 2019, even if you're not ready to file. So, you know, a lot of us are saying, I'm not, I, I don't time to, to file yet. 
You just need to fill it out. And then you can actually submit, they look at line 31. That's the mm -hmm. amount of income that they look for, for your, your annual income. And then you take, it's gonna be looking at it monthly and then it'll be two and a half times uh, the month, um, monthly income. So it's really doing that schedule C, that's key. Uh, that's the first key. And then the second is where do you go? Um, and there's been a lot of talk about that. My bank was accepting um, applications, but after I screwed up twice, did I mention that <laughs> before? Uh, they said, okay, no, we're not we're taking it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just did a search on the internet and found a bank I'd never heard of. Um, I checked, they were real. Um, I can give the name if you want it, but even more importantly, I just learned about a new um, uh, fund um, Magic Johnson has put together a fund of $100 million, and I actually wrote down the, um, the website if people want that, because they are, they are part of the PPP. And of course, then you have to know how to use the money to make sure it becomes a grant, not a loan. So um, I think some of the things that Katie was talking about and, um, and Raphael in terms of allowing benefits for, for people um, it's just really, really key. So, mm -hmm. just a reminder for for our audience: if you've got questions for anyone, use the hashtag BW Town Hall, and which we'll be able to spot and we can ask a few more questions to our guests. Raphael, I wanted to ask you: you used a word um, that I think Katie, I'd also like to hear you on a little bit, but advocacy, right? You're you're, you're sort of the voice to a ton of people right now. Um, I'm wondering how this conversation is going to go going forward. Uh, because we're, this could be a long slog with perhaps no end in sight again for a while. Um, wh what are you guys doing on the advocacy side? And Raphael, I'm going to start with you since you've been on the other side of this table mm -hmm. as an elected official, right? What, how, how are these conversations going? Yeah, I, I would say that as elected official, I can tell you that uh, freelancers are issues and they're really brought to the forefront, you know, and uh, I think elected officials think about small businesses. They think about the individual worker, labor in general. Uh, but freelancers have been left out of the tradition, have been left out of that conversation. Uh, so coming in as, as the new president of the union, you know, I, I made it my goal to look at uh, how can we finally penetrate the larger conversation. And I think that this pandemic has actually shed a light on the need for that. Uh, you know, this has really shown the vulnerabilities that the workforce faces, especially during economic downturns, and where the traditional small business, the traditional worker, uh, they have a, a large social safety net, uh, freelancers don't. And even even when you have programs like PPP expanded, when you have programs like UI expanded, freelance workers are left behind. Uh, they're asked to apply later or, or or the system's not working for them because they're not sure how to calculate their income. Uh, so those are the things that we really are going to focus on looking at how can we bring freelance work to the top of the conversation when we talk about work. You know, it's often said that freelance work is the future of work. Uh, and officers have to catch up with that and make sure that the policy will affect it. Yeah. The um the calculating the income question. The, I mean, you referred to that some. Ed talked about these things too. The W two versus the ten forty. Um, so that seems yeah. to be a key area to provide services and support. Do you hear that a lot from your members, Katie or Raphael? And um and what do you generally tell people about trying to to do that to better keep track of their income and to be very clear on the differences between the kind that would fall under W-2 versus 1040 and what have you. Uh, I, can I just jump yes. into what Raphael was just saying and then yeah. get to that too? Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you're talking about advocacy, the one thing that I think has been really challenging and I think has really been exacerbated by this crisis is actually the federal government is not, has not, is not is not set up to deal with this population of people and I, i'm not saying it can't get there but you know one of the things i've been talking about is you know our federal government still operates in a very 1970s labor market workforce idea that like you know work is done you have a defined benefits or a defined contributions plan and like you move forward through work and i think you've seen this over the last couple of decades where like the data collection has not caught up to the fact that we to Raphael's comment are like working by choice very differently today. And so, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks when I have a spare moment is, you know, what is the mechanism? It's not SBA, you know, no fault to SBA, but they are not set up to help the self-employed, 
micro businesses or, you know, probably businesses, you know, between 50 and 100 employees. Like that's not what they're set up to do. And then, you know, Raphael, like they're not set up to help freelancers. They don't understand freelancers. They don't understand how they work in this economy. And that was like brutally like just like brutal when they were putting out the rules. Like, I don't know about you, Raphael. They didn't reach out to me and ask me like, okay, you work with this population of people. Like the words we use are important. The forms that we're asking for, the guidance we're giving to the banks because banks don't deal with the self-employed. So, you know, the challenge is, is that you have to know what you don't know. And to the point that was also made that we are like building the plane as we are flying it. I think that there is now an opportunity for us to pause in a way that is thoughtful to say, this pandemic is going to impact this population of people for many months. What do we actually need to do? What is the best mechanism to support them? And then build it. And again, you know, hopefully not create what I would call, you know, a giant shit show of PPP for the self-employed, but something that can really help them and help those micro businesses um, not just survive, but I think thrive in this pandemic. And so I will, I know I'm, I'm trying to play to Joel's 30 second rule. So I think I, uh, <laughs> okay. it's actually our producer's 30 second rule, but um, Cynthia, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll give you a chance to, you know, on the other side, the, the, you know, Raphael and Katie are both, you know, effectively in an advocacy role. I'm wondering for you as a sole proprietor, what do you want your advocates to know? <laughs> there you go. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, Katie, I wanna thank you. You kept saying people need money and that's really key. And, you know, I've been listening to what um, other uh, countries are doing because, you know, this is worldwide. Um, people, there are countries that are giving people money. They, they don't have them jumping through a, a million hoops. So. Uh, you know, when I talk to, I knew I was going to be on this program, I talk to other people in similar situations. And I, I heard you, Raphael, whether it's gig worker or whether it's someone that's a professional, we're all in the same boat. We all provide a service and we all need to be respected. So a, a lot of people were saying, you know, oh, I didn't apply for this program because I don't know how, or I thought it was going to be too much work. And that's why I, I've been reaching out and trying to simplify it once I found out, oh yeah, I got some money. But we shouldn't have to go through all of that. You know, the self-employed, there was a time when I had accountants on staff and I had, you know, I had people, but I, I scaled down for a reason, but I don't have all those people on staff. I want to spend my time focused on how I can, you know, get the get new skills so that I can be productive and work and get money. Not, okay, what line do I need to, what form, what line, what bank I need to go to. That was very time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so they need to just give checks, give to the people that if you filed your tax return, send out checks, send out checks to everyone without asking us how we're spending it, because you're not asking all of the guys how they're spending it. So just for the little bit of money that you're going to give us, you don't need all of this accountability. You don't need to know whether we did 75% on payroll and then did you spend it on the mortgage or the mortgage uh, principal or the mortgage interest because one counts and the other doesn't count. You know, I'm opening myself up oh, to help. Oh, I need but, to oh, I don't. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that. And, and contact your your um, your elected officials. That's where I know your name, Raphael. It was um, because you're an elected <laughs> official. I, 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 yeah, reach out because I've been reaching out to my um, my officials and saying, um, "Hey, this is where I am. This is this is what other people like me need." So I just wanted to mention that. So I have one. Uh, here's uh, we've had a handful of listener questions come through. We've sort of covered this ground, but I'll mention it. One person on Facebook was asking, "Is the freelancer unemployment insurance possible to get if you've had little and unpredictable freelance work?" Um, Raphael. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if uh, the the law was written very broadly, if you're someone who's out of work and was working, uh, you should be able to qualify. That's that's a good now, and that's also um, in addition to coming to your site for information on that. Is that a state by state? Like they'll need to check in with their state unemployment office and their website to kind of look at what the requirements are in terms of applying for it, right? Uh, very broadly, I would say that. The, the requirements are, are pretty much uh, the same across the board. Certain states are deciding on how they're determining how much money you get at the end of the day. 
uh, which is where a lot of the issues issues that we're in our country is coming from. But for the most part, you know, it's showing how much money you make throughout, throughout the year. Okay. And can I, I can I follow up on that? Also, um, yes. some people have gone for unemployment where they might qualify for the PPP, and they might get more money. So that's something people should take a look to see. Even though it's a it's short term, it's only you have to use the money within two months. You're probably going to get more money during that two months, and then you can go for the unemployment. The okay. other thing is with unemployment, if you do anything that's considered classified as work then you reduce your unemployment rate. Whereas PPP, there's no requirement. Again, you gotta know how to jump through the hoops, but there's no requirement that you not work. That's so good. that's something just to consider. Okay, thank you. I think, can I just jump in on that, Dimitri and Joel? I think that's like, that is the point of this. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're all invested in getting people back to work and providing them different pathways to, to get there. So if it is unemployment, like use unemployment, like apply for it. Like it, it's really important. Like that is going to allow you to, I think to Ed's point, you know, he does have a little bit of a savings that he's able to, to secure and ensure that, you know, as things start to ramp up and maybe that unemployment benefit decreases over time that he's okay. So people should use that. If people you know, are eligible and can navigate the PPP or the emergency uh, economic injury disaster loan process, do that. Because at the end of the day, like, I will fight anyone on the street that says that people don't want to work. People want to work, but these programs are here to help people through this pandemic. And uh, I don't want people to be afraid to take them because insert whatever issue we need to get people and, and, and Cynthia, to the point, like some of these things are actually getting cash to people. And again, that is ensuring you have a home, you have food on your table, you have electricity. Like those are important things So don't discount that. And like we will work together smart people to help and push forward policies that are going to continue to allow you to to get through this hurdle. But don't be afraid to access these programs and take it and take them because they are there for you and they're there to help you through this um, challenging time. Katie, one of the things that I think resonates with what you're saying there is, and I, what, what, I think one of the elements that makes the pandemic so difficult for all of us, and maybe we, we just haven't really articulated it this way, is that we find, we find value through work, right? There's a sense of dignity that we find through our ability to do our job. And when suddenly that becomes deprived of us, it becomes a really disorientating feeling. And yeah. so much of this becomes just this quest for answers, but it's rooted in that sense of like, what do I, what do I do? Yeah. What, I, you know, what do I make with my hands or my mind that I add value to the world? And I think there's the, there's the, that's going to be this ongoing little um, problem that we're all wrestling with until we're, we're back to a world that has, some stability. And Ed, I want to, I want to point that kind of to, toward you, you know, like here, here you are, you're, you're out of work. You're wrestling with that. You've got a, a career that you, you know, find value in. Um, what have you, where are the holes that you've sort of been able to fill that might also benefit some other people in, in regarding, um, you know, how, the, sort of the, the search for good information? Oh man, uh, that last bit that you said, I was thinking all throughout what all the other panelists were saying, um, the search for information, that's been the toughest part in this whole process for sure of like how, where do I look to get the questions that I'm trying to get answered? <laughs> and like, I, it, it's been very hard through the government websites of like UI or PUA, how to get any information from that. and. The, the biggest thing that helped me for that was um, there was this Facebook group of <laughs> Californian freelancers uh, that just did their own thing, created this group to help other people. And that resource alone like answered so many of my questions. They had like an FAQ on there that had basically answers to what I was questioning the whole time. Um, and I think the sense of community and trying to find that sense of community to answer those questions, it was the biggest beneficial thing to me, uh, with all these, uh, things that we're bringing up, you know, uh, I wish that the government sites were better, you know, like, I feel like that is the resource that people are going to go to first. And like you said that, like they're stuck in the seventies, like they need to update the technology side of, 
everything because that's where we are right now and we're not going to be able to get that information any other way so well the other thing that was resonating just now was something you shared with me ed when we chatted before as we were all talking about working the desire to work the need to work i mean in addition to it being something yes we do to survive many people such as yourself i think are in careers that they really love and yeah. they actually really love working they love you were telling me about making films and 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 being able to work on something that you know somebody's going to go to a movie theater to see and it's very hard in this time to think about how not it's not just that you're not working it's like What's going to happen to these these things that I love, these movies on a big screen in a movie theater? And I was wondering if you might just touch on that very quickly before we wrap up with everyone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the whole reason why I chose this industry is because I wanted to do something that I love. Like, I love making films. I love being on set. I love the people that I work with. I love the spontaneity of it. And I love creating something that other people can see and react to emotionally you know like that's the whole reason why any of us artists are doing the work that we do uh so that we can touch people on an emotional level and you know like even right now like i'm sure many of the people watching this are finding their solace in entertainment you know like entertainment doesn't go away when bad things happen that's there for us to escape from the world and you know at this point none of us are making that art that we love but uh we hope to start making it soon so that we can help the mass population of what's to come you know uh so yeah i have to ask a follow-up ed I, I wouldn't be doing my job if i didn't but what should i be watching <laughs> just escape i mean just watch think about it react to it how you re want to react to it no, no, I need, uh, I need a title of something that I have to watch, and I need parasite. you to watch me. <laughs> parasite. Okay, Parasite. Parasite, yes. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to end with the speed round. Um, Raphael, I want to I start with you. Um, we'll go Brady Bunch style here and hop around a little bit. Uh, what What is something actionable that you want a viewer of this to go out? Hopefully, this is someone who's freelance or sole proprietor. What do you want them to take away from this and, and know as they go forward here? Yeah, one, join the union. It's free. Uh, so please, it's a way to build community. As Ed mentioned, it's important that people have a network that they can speak to each other at and, and get information. Uh, but two, uh, right now, we're really focused on the, the new federal stimulus package that's going to come out of uh, the House. I think it's time we look at how do we uh, cancel rent and mortgages, uh, suspend that so that people uh, can get relief on that one. And also, uh, we need to look at how do we get cash in people's homes. So the $2,000 a month uh, proposal is something that we're supportive of as well. So call your legislator, ask for those two things, and they'll provide real relief for you as a freelancer. Katie, we're going to throw the same question to you. Speed round. Uh, I, I think it's just uh, knowing the power of your own voice and how important it is uh, not to be political because the National Association of Self-Employed is bipartisan, but we did have the opportunity to um, do a pretty big call with Speaker Pelosi. Uh, and one of the things that she said that I've been saying a lot to all audiences so they can take it is, you know, knowing your voice and using your voice um, and not being afraid of, of, of it. Um, and so I think it's been talked about a little bit, Cynthia brought it up, but contact not just your federal lawmakers, but your state and local lawmakers, share your story, talk about the challenges that you're having um, and really lean into that in being your own best advocate. You know, the National Association for the Self-Employed is happy to be your advocate, but we think it's way more authentic for you to call, to you to reach out, to you to tell me, you know, what is important to you and that we can translate that. So I just really encourage people like, you know, lean into that voice, lean into that power um, and be your own advocate. Cynthia, your, your moment of zen. <laughs> uh, well, I want to echo some of the things that Raphael and Katie um, have already said, um, and actually, Ed, uh, I think networking is important, whether you join an organization or you join with um, other people that are going through similar situations and learn from them. Um, be an advocate for yourself and for others. Um, and so short term, you know, take advantage of what the government's offering and long term advocate for something that uh, 
looks better, better world, fairer for people that are not doing the traditional route of working as an employee. Because many of us have been employees before, so we know what that's like. But you're, you know, I think Katie, you mentioned it, or maybe Raphael, that people don't always know the importance of people and how big it is of people who are self-employed and we're really very proud of the work that we do. So. And, and uh, I asked you for uh, a show recommendation. You gave us pandemic, but I also want to ask you for something that that ties the puts the bow on it all. What what do you want folks to know as they as they think about uh, the sole proprietors of the world out there? Uh, I think just try to stay sane and get through this. You know, like I think mentally that is what everyone should be doing. Uh, that's what I'm doing. I think that being able to relate that other people out there are going through the same thing, that we're all in it together and we're trying to get through it. So let's try to stay sane, try to stay uh, mentally happy. That's great, thank you. I could use more of that in my life too. So it's a good reminder, thank you. We Ed. all could. Uh, okay, so on behalf of Bloomberg, on behalf of Bloomberg Business Week, I just wanna th say thank you to Raphael, Ed, Cynthia, Katie, just a, a absolute pleasure to have you on. Also, Demetra, as always, doing great. Thank you. Thank you for doing this with me. Thank you to all. It's been a Thank great you. discussion. And uh, it was about sole proprietors and freelancers. But again, the message is always really strongly that you've got to find your community and tap into those communities. Just because you're working on your own doesn't mean you're alone in it. So, And, and just a reminder that we'll have more resources for you at businessweek.com. So please... Okay. Uh, stay tuned there, and we'll be back soon with another one of our town halls. Thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank it's been you. a real pleasure.